You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Mark Resipsinski and I, Niels Kastelarsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners, this podcast series is all about voicing our differences on the one topic that brings us together, namely systematic investing, using the often overlooked but very robust strategy of trend following. Now, we hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Rob, where we discussed lots of different topics like market and parameter selection, and also what happens if a brokerage firms fail and much more. But also, I would encourage you to listen to the midweek episode that we published on Wednesday, where this week we caught up again with Rory Johnston of Commodity Context to discuss the SPR, so the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that has been actively deployed by the Biden administration over the past year or so. Um, and with crude oil hitting this week, the price level that has been mentioned as a level where it would start to refill the SPR, this was quite a timely conversation. So if you missed any of these conversations, I would really encourage you to go and listen to them as soon as you're finishing listen, uh, listening to Mark and I. And... Of course, uh, if you have more time on your hands, um, you should definitely check out the episodes I've done with Alan, where we've spoken to the largest CTA firms in the world, and um, I think where we are probably for the first time bringing them all together more or less at the same time. So, lots to dive into, but today, Mark, it's just you and I after a, I uh, wouldn't call it a quiet week, would you? No, not quiet at all. <laughs> we, we've got a lot of event risk going on and a lot of... Uh, intervention by governments uh, and and I think that uh, you know we've got a lot of surprises uh, that, that have occurred and I think we'll see more in the next week uh, and I believe that this is a uh, I'll call it the cockroach theory of uh, of of blow-ups usually there's never just one so you turn on the lights you might see one but there's a lot more lurking behind the baseboards there's a lot more surprises that may be lurking right around the corner Absolutely. It's one of those weeks where markets humble you as they do from time to time. And uh, I think that's probably a really good reminder uh, when, um, you know, when these things happen, you know, even if they don't feel very pleasant at the time. All right. So let me try and give uh, a little bit of context to what's been going on. And uh, Mark, I'm sure afterwards you might have some comments, but um, I know, Mark, you you have children, although they are not really children anymore, but I'm sure you remember the concept of the participation trophy. So this is where organizers of a game or a competition want to make sure all participants feel good about themselves so everyone gets a trophy. And for the younger kids, quite often the parents discourage keeping score and or even declaring a winner. And this week kind of felt like it was a trophy day for the banking system. Let me explain. The first trophy went to Silicon Valley Bank for their mismanagement of their hold to maturity book by establishing a duration that suffered a significant loss of value from the Fed's draconic rate hikes to date. The FDIC, which guarantees deposits up to $250,000 in the U.S., on Sunday evening announced that the guarantee would be extended to all depositories, regardless of the size of their deposit. As have been communicated, many of the deposits were the working capital of promising, albeit not profitable, startups. Startups that should uh, break through and prove successful, how um, hold a winning lottery ticket uh, for the founders to hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars. So, as to ensure that all financial institutions were treated fairly at trophy time, the FDIC effectively offered the same guarantee to all banking institutions, large and small. Deposits in the US banking system total approximately $20 trillion with a T. 
Not to be outdone by the FDIC, the Federal Reserve implemented the Bank Term Funding Program, which commits the central bank to lend to financial institutions for a term up to 12 months, valuing their collateral at 100 cents on the dollar, despite what the current market value of collateral of the collateral. In other words, if you pledged a 1.125% August 2040 long bond, which is currently valued at 67 cents, then the entity that does that can borrow at 100 cents on the dollar. So arguably, this could be the third iteration of quantitative easing. Then on Thursday, a consortium of banks pledged to deposit $30 billion at Trouble First Republic Bank in an effort to avoid what happened at Silicon Valley Bank. First Republic, in similar fashion to SVB, had extended its hold to maturity portfolio and was facing a deposit run that they couldn't meet. And one can only guess at the arm twisting that Yellen and Powell applied in getting the usually quite competitive banking industry to support a competitor at a time of need. Now, of course, no one is served by the massive run and potential collapse of the banking system. I get that. But that leads to the question of why this happened. And the blame falls mostly squarely on the Federal Reserve. After years of suppressed interest rates and irresponsible monetary policy, the Fed went on the opposite direction and yield-starved investors, both institutional and retail, pounced on the, re- on the rising rates. As a result, bonds of all stripes registered losses month after month in 2022. It was headline news at least weekly throughout the entire year. One would think with that backdrop, the regulators would be extra sensitive to the hold to maturity accounts at the banking system with regards to investor confidence and liquidity of the banking system. But this was missed entirely. Anyways, next week, FOMC meeting is likely to be an interesting gathering. Will the Fed continue uh, with their inflation-fighting rate hike or pause? Many now expect the latter. Less important is how Powell will be treated at the press conference. The entirety of the uh, mess should, to a large extent, be laid at his doorstep. But the press call has historically loathed pinning him down on difficult topics. But Powell himself should offer an explanation. The Fed is, after all, the central bank. All right, Mark, let me bring you in here. I imagine that some of the things that have caught your attention, at least the things you remember since we last spoke, would have been linked to what happened the last week or so. Well, absolutely. And let's let's start with the overall theme. And I think you framed the banking issue very well. But we're in a period of what I call the great bond repricing. We've gone from zero interest rates up to four and a half percent, you know, and maybe going higher. We don't know how much higher now. That's in doubt. But think of this as a great repricing. And when the great repricing has occurred, this is that that means all of the assets are going to have to have a change in value, and those values are going down. So discount rate goes up. Price of bonds go down. It doesn't matter when you hold it. Those losses are going to have to be realized. You can attempt to hedge, but hedges don't eliminate risk. Hedges just shift the risk to somebody else. So somebody is going to have to pay the price of the repricing, and this is what we're seeing. So if there is a systemic problem, it's across all asset classes. It's it's starting at banks. But I think we're going to see it in the REITs market, okay, which are obviously very interest rate sensitive. We're going to see it in insurance, insurance companies. They're also very rate sensitive. We're also, we haven't seen it to date, not because this repricing hasn't been occurring. It's because accounting rules allow for frictions. That, mean, that means that losses don't have to be realized immediately as, as you would if you mark to market all of your securities. So the great part about the futures markets has always been that all of the assets are marked to market every day. You don't see that in in other institutions, and that's where the problem really comes in. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, and I was I wasn't sure whether this thing about not having to mark to market was a European thing or a US thing, or maybe it's both. But but that I think is just the canary in the coal mine that we have no idea really 
what the unrealized losses are. Uh, and there's one group of investors that you didn't even mention, which I think is a really big issue as well, and that's the pension funds. Uh, now, being Danish, I follow the Danish press uh, a- as well, and uh, the largest public pension fund, or the largest pension fund in Denmark, had some extraordinary losses last year, uh, mind-blowing losses, really, and you know, definitely linked to rising interest rates. So probably as as we saw in in some of these other institutions that um, blew up this week so well well the work is being done so so that's the interesting part because uh, even on on our level with you know my partners we went through all of the banks and you can actually find out exactly how much of the assets are held and uh, held to maturity accounts you can find out how much of their deposits are insured versus uninsured so you can find out exactly, and you can calculate exactly what would be the unrealized losses for banks. And so, so I think that let's go back to uh, you know swan thinking. So oftentimes, some people might actually start to say glibly, "Oh, this was a black swan event." So in reality, <laughs> it wasn't a black swan. It could be a pink flamingo in the sense is that it was right there, or you could use other zoo animals. It's it's a gray rhino or it's in a leopard in the sense is that the risk was out there. We just didn't see it. So that's different than a black swan where it was in, a, it was in an unknown event that no one really handicapped. The information is all available. It's a question if now people are realizing. So you have the great repricing of bonds. And now you have market participants starting to realize what is the impact of the great repricing. So, and and this is why when you think in terms of trends, this is what is going to cause a trend. And this is because it's not going to, this is not just one isolated event that's going to end here. It's going to continue because we see bank one. Now that now there's clearly there was some bad management here on their asset and liability mismatch. So then we go down to the next bank. You say like, well, there could be bad management here. And then we realize is that it's not just bad management at a few. Those might be extreme. But now we sort of see that there's a whole set of banks that have, have held to maturity and uh, uh, treasuries, which is not a credit risk problem because it's of the highest quality, but it's a duration mismatch problem. And you'd say, well, if they have it, the next person has it. If if we actually mark to market, and we have to take those realized losses, then what we uh, we can actually determine uh, what would be the loss for each individual bank. And I'll throw out a word that I haven't heard for a while that I think applies here, which is financial disintermediation. So it's a word that's probably come out of use. But if you go back in time, you say that what's really occurring is in, in terms of financial disintermediation, is that banks have not really given competitive rates for their depositors. So the great part about it is in the short term, rates have gone up. You don't pay the depositors the same. You could actually increase your uh, net interest income because you, you got a better gap. Now, money market funds, they've been actually becoming pretty competitive. Their cost is a lot less. There's not bricks and mortars. They don't have to pay for FDIC insurance. And the great part about that is that they could go to the uh, to the Fed, and they can do reverse repos in Treasuries. So we've seen that increase by to two point four trillion dollars. So the money market funds are can be able to get cheap funding at a very high rate, and so depositors see that they say, "Well, I'm not getting money on my uh, on my." Uh, on my deposits at the bank, I'm pulling it out and going into money market funds. So, for example, the Fidelity Money Market Fund, their their biggest one, their, their weighted average maturity is seven days, and they have a tremendous amount over you know let's say over two thirds of their exposure is in reverse repo. So, so in some senses, is that they've allowed be, money market funds to be able to get cheap funding, which causes financial disintermediation, which is leading to to the problem, because if nobody, if no depositors leave the bank, then the held to maturity account securities never have to be sold. If they never have to be sold, 
well, then you don't have to realize any losses. So, so the financial disintermediation leads to deposit outflows, which means is that now you got to sell the securities that are at a loss. And part of that is associated with the fact that the Fed allows for, uh, for higher rates somewhere else through reverse repos. And and are money market funds, they're obviously, I, I imagine, not insured in any way, shape, or form. I mean, is there a, is there a risk in that sec part of the financial system? Well, that, well, that's really interesting. This is that this is this is the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> so, so money market funds in two thousand and eight, you know, a lot of them invested and reached for yield by you know, buying into corporate commercial paper. And so, so then the, the thought was, is that, well, if they buy commercial paper, they may break the buck, which means is that the value of that commercial paper may be less than a value of one, which means you may not get one for one for every dollar you put into your money market fund. So the government said, well, look, you have to have a certain amount of, of assets that are liquid. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that we're going to increase the amount that you have to hold in, in the non-risky assets in treasuries. So now uh, by doing that, they're increased the demand for treasury bills. If you increase the demand for treasury bills for all these money market funds, what are they going to do? You're going to bid up the price for treasury bills. You're going to drive interest rates down to close to zero or actually to negative rates. So then what happened? Said like, well, we can't have that happen. So now what we got to do set up this reverse repo facility so that we can be able to be able to uh, allow for money market funds a place to be able to put their assets. And so by doing that, then they say like, well, every time we raise rates, the, the rate on reverse repo increases. So therefore we allow for higher rates and money market funds. And if deposit rates don't increase in, in lockstep, you're going to create the uh, the uh, disintermediation from banks to money market funds, and we also see it even just in household treasuries. You know, households are buying uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of treasury securities, especially in the short end. You know, it would be ninety day bills, one year uh, bills, so, which they didn't before. For a simple reason, they get a better rate than what they would on their banks. So you have financial disintermediation on that side. And that means is that eventually all of those assets they hold are going to have to be, those losses are going to have to be realized. And that's where the problem comes in. So it's yeah. not over and yet. <laughs> it's not over yet. And and in fairness, we've talked about the U.S. banking system so far, but uh, unfortunately, uh, close to my home, uh, we have a slight problem with the second largest bank in Switzerland called Credit Suisse. Um, I don't know the details of of that, but um, but I did notice uh, someone mentioning that the share price of Credit Suisse since 2008, when the banking crisis kind of began, is down. Uh, we're we're down at some point this week, down 97. percent I mean, that's that's a that's a loss that will take a little while to um, to recoup. And even from a modeler's point of view, what you find out is as stock prices get lower and lower, then the volatility gets higher because just a small change is, causes a huge increase in volatility. It's harder if you're a long short investor, then that means is that it's harder to short, it's harder to borrow uh, uh, borrow that stock. And so in some sense is uh, that you know, firm, we, we put in certain exclusions. So if the price goes below a certain level, we won't trade it at all. And so, so what you sort of see what happens is the dynamics change as those prices get lower and lower. But when you think about it from a European perspective, you had negative interest rates. Now you got positive interest rates. You just the ECB just raised rates fifty basis points, and so you're having the same problem in the U.S. And it again, it may not have been realized yet because of accounting rules, but the losses are accruing across the board for all of the financial firms. It's just a matter of when they're now going to be realized. Speaking about. Volatility. Speaking about losses, we do need to talk about trend following marks. So let me uh, give a little bit of uh, context. So we did have some extreme moves uh, in the markets, especially in the short end of the yield curve this week. Um, and maybe to put kind of the size of these move into perspective, the U.S. two-year yield on Monday declined as much as 60 or 61 basis points 
And that's the biggest one-day decline since, I think, late 1982. So in other words, uh, the move was larger than anything we saw during the uh, 2007 to 2009 financial crisis uh, or the 9-11 or even the 1987 stock market crash, just to put things into perspective. Now, CTAs um, saw also a quote-unquote historic drop in performance on Monday. The SD Trend Index, as far as I can tell, registered its second largest daily drop of about 5.6%, which is only surpassed by a 7.3% drop in performance on September 4th, 2001. And that goes back to the year 2000 um, when the index started. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that only a couple of days ago, a couple of days before this started, some managers, certainly one I know pretty well, were making new all-time intramonth highs. So, you know, again, just putting things into context. It was a rough week, but, you know, go back a few more days and everything looked pretty, pretty good. Now, to me, uh, this feels a little bit like, or actually a lot like, the Thanksgiving 2021 correction, where we saw trend-following strategies also have a pretty significant correction in performance between November 26th and November, November 29th. Uh, of course, this particular correction uh, in late November 2021 was, we now know, was the beginning of one of the strongest performance periods for trend followers in many, many years. I'm not suggesting that this will play out the same way this time around, but we just need to put things in historic uh, perspective. Now, as we know, trend following strategies are adaptive and therefore you know, many programs this week would have decreased the portfolio risk exposure. And, of course, specifically in the short fixed income area, positions would have been cut significantly, as well as maybe some of the long equity positions. Now, I know this might open a debate about using dynamic position sizing or not, but that's not the point I want to make today. Uh, I have no idea what static position size strategies would have done, um, but as we know, there's definitely room for both of them. So I, to some extent, I think for the longer term trend followers, I think positions overall may have remained directionally the same as before uh, the crisis, but with much smaller position size. And therefore, it will still reflect some kind of inflation trade to some extent. And therefore, it will be somewhat interesting to see if the Fed ha hand of the Fed sh shakes a bit uh, next week and they... They go away from fighting inflation, which could lead to much bigger problems maybe later this year or next year. Who knows? Now, if the past week turns out to be an overreaction and the prevailing trade uh, trends that have been strong for the past year or so uh, are re-engaged, well, trend-following performance will remain directionally as is and exposure will calibrate according to current market conditions going forward. Alternatively, if the past week turns out to be the beginning of a transition period where, uh, you know, where there is some follow through uh, on trend reversals um, and that we see some sustained price action against current positioning, well, then strategies will simply exit and, and the posture of the positions uh, will change. As a trend follower, our process is free from making decisions about what the markets will do next. We simply apply a reactive process that follows price across a globally diversified portfolio in recognition of the fact that the majority of our alpha will be delivered in those times when predictors get it so wrong. So, Mark, tell me, well, maybe I could just uh, give people a little bit of context in terms of the numbers. My own trend barometer, yeah, it's at the lower side. It's at 34, but it's and it was lower during the week for sure, but we'll see. And in terms of performance, you know, yeah, it's not pretty, but it's not too bad either. B top 50 is down 5.18% for the month, down 4% for the year. But again, it was up 15% last year. Sock Gen CTA index down 65 for the month, down 53 for the year, but it was up 20% last year. Sock Gen Trend down 78 for the for the month, down 74 for the year, but it was up 27% last year. The short-term traders index, um, well, uh, I think, is down 1.91% for the month 
and down 2.26% for the year. Now, it was up 11% last year, but one of their selling points is kind of this thing about, well, we can make money if there comes a big, you know, short-term uh, event, et cetera, et cetera, but not this time, uh, it looks like. MSCI World is down about 2% for the month, still up 2 for the year. Government bonds obviously had a great uh, run. Um, the World Government Bond Index is up, up about 3% for the month so far. And the S&P uh, is down one3 for the month, but still up 2% for the year. All right, that was a lot of information, Mark. Before we get to the various articles, what 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 um, what have, what are the key takeaways in terms of trend, in terms of this week, in terms of how you see it with all of your decades of experience from this space? Well, what we've seen in one week is is the ability to uh, differentiate across managers, <laughs> which might take years, has all been compacted in about one week. So. Let's let's try to look at this. If you're a long-term trend follower, long-term trend followers in some cases have not changed positions. They've taken some big losses, but they haven't changed positions. And if you just look at a chart and you you could run a longer-term moving average, and you'll see that that they haven't sort of pierced you know very longer-term averages. Short-term people reversed. Okay, so right away you got a difference between short and long-term. Stop, stops versus non-stops. If you had a stop, you probably got stopped out of your positions. So, and and what does a stop really do? It says there's something wrong with my model, or there's something wrong with the environment that I need to take a rest. So, a stop is saying here's a time to sort of say let's regroup. So, you're going to see that between the managers. Third, you're going to sort of see the difference between uh, how do, how you sort of adjust positions to increased volatility. Given the increased volatility and in, in what we've seen in the marketplace, some people sort of took off exposures, you know, significantly, which seemed to make prudent sense. The people who say, nope, we keep uh, static position sizes through volatility, you're going to see that they're going to take bigger losses and they might see bigger gains if we see a reversal again. Finally, you're going to see w- whether people are interventionist or non-interventions. There's always an, uh, you will say that there's a spectrum of behavior. One would say, I always follow my models. I never change. Others might sort of say, well, you know, I don't know what's going on. So maybe I should cut back my exposure overall. And so and I don't think that there's anything wrong if you say that there's a high level of uncertainty. You say like, I'm going to override some of my models and I'm just going to cut exposure or cut risk. And then finally, you're going to sort of say that there's the difference between those people who are purist about a strategy. So you say, like, maybe I'm just saying I only follow trends versus those who say I follow an ensemble approach. So I'm I'm an ensemble modeler. So I say, like, look, you want to have a number of different models because if you have a changing environment, you want to be able to uh, allow for profits or uh, in, in different ways, given the market changes in different ways. So if you, if you say, I'm only a long-term trend follower, you're going to have a very different profile than if you have someone who's an ensemble modeler. So all of the discussions that you've been having on this podcast for years all come to fruition and all come together in one week to differentiate Who's making money? Who's losing money? And what are the size of those gains or losses? Yeah. So a couple of interesting uh, thoughts on on this. One is that to some extent, okay, maybe for this week, there's going to be somewhat of a difference in performance. But I bet you, if you vol adjust performance, maybe there aren't that big of a difference in performance you know, e- even between the other big discussion that we have uh, from time to time, and that is even if you trade 300 markets versus 50 or 60 markets, did you really see on a vol-adjusted basis a massive difference in performance? I'm not sure. I don't know what the numbers are, of course, uh, so far. The other thing I think it really uh, brings out is something that Rich and I wrote about in the um, monthly performance, trend-following performance report we just published on the website, on the Top Traders Unplugged website, on the blog post. Um, we we showcase a little bit, we talk a little bit about the lifting power of trend-following and how it, it helps a 60-40 portfolio. 
And again, I, I haven't run the numbers because I just there's not enough time in a week like this. But but again, if you if we always say to people, the trend following, unless you are a trend follower like maybe we are, okay, maybe we would put uh, and do put a large part of our you know liquid net worth into trend following. That's fine. For most investors, this is part of a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds and 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 then trend following, for example, just like. Dr. Lindner wrote about in 1983. And, and and I'm thinking, sort of just looking at the numbers, just thinking about the numbers in my head. If you had a portfolio of, say, 40% stocks, 40% bonds, 20% trend following, a week like this wouldn't even be something you would notice probably because performance-wise, when you blend it, it's probably not that bad. Um, you know, stocks were up a little bit in the US, bonds were up strong, Okay, trends were trend followers were down, but it has a smaller allocation usually. So, I just think, as you rightly say, it kind of summarizes to many in many ways what we have been talking about for the past nine years on the podcast, uh, and why all portfolios really, or all, all investors really, should have an allocation because even at a time when, and this is another point I wanted to raise, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What's interesting about this is that most trend followers, even someone like Don, we've been doing this for 48 years, we don't have an event in our research data like this. We, we don't have, a, you know, maybe from 82, because we traded from the 70s, okay, maybe you could say it's in our data. But most managers, most trend followers, don't have a move in fixed income like we've just seen in the research data, and yet these strategies are perfectly capable to deal with them. Yeah, sure, we lost some money. We've given back, you know, a bit more than we made in February and certainly not as much as we made in 2022. So it's not, in the bigger scheme of things, it's not a big deal. Um, and and I think that's, that's the beauty of what we do. Uh, and I think that showcases the robustness of what we do, that even when things that are completely out of what we've seen before, um, these models are able to cope with them. I'm not saying the drawdown in performance is is over. It could continue for sure. But big events like this where some banks blow up and, and so on and so forth is not usually what kills a trend-following strategy. Right. Well, a couple things to unpack is that the first, going back to the idea that we're, where we said this is a microcosm of everything compacted in a very tight one-week window. I will sort of say that we could sort of see the ordering of performance based on the, some characteristics, maybe one way this week. We, we could play this forward in two weeks, and that ordering of performance could change radically. So, so the people who are the long-term trend followers who didn't get out of positions this week took large losses. They may be the top winners in two weeks' time. So... So we'll sort of say that while we say this is a microcosm, that doesn't mean that one strategy is better than another in, in terms of your choice set of what you've done. Because in two weeks, they could be reversed the other set. That's that's what uh, what volatility is all about. Now, the other point you made is, is really good. <laughs> it says that whenever you build a quantitative model, it's, you don't sort of say, I'm building a model that will take an account for events such as a bank run. You can't do that. Uh, well, one is that there are some events you don't have in your back test. So, but you try to back test as best you can. But you have to anticipate as a, as a uh, model builder that there will be events that I have not included in, or are not included in my back test that I have to anticipate may occur and should be uh, accounted for. What do I mean by that? In a broader thinking, this is what you know I, I like to call anticipatory thinking. So, an anticipatory thinking, you know, and is, is coming out of you know the work of Gary Klein, who's into naturalistic decision making, and the naturalistic decision making often talks about what we call heuristics. And heuristics that, that uh, often, uh, you know, one way to describe them is 
that they're fast and frugal decision makings. How do I make fast decisions with a frugal no, um, amount of uh, of data or information? And in this sense, this is that well, there are events I don't know about, say a bank crisis. So what it means is is that how do I make sure I have a diversified portfolio? How do I make sure that maybe I have different time frames? So maybe a short term as well as a long term model. How do I make sure that you know I have uh, you know, uh, different styles or approaches. So, so the, you know, well, well, we've often talked about trend following. It also may mean that you may want to include other strategies. And so as a change point technology person or cha- looking for change points, you say, well, how do I also have models that can, you know, handle reversals? So, so in terms of always, I always look at three dimensions that how do you diversify across style, timing, and markets that, you say since I don't know that there are that there are uh, there are events I don't know about there are events I can't handicap then how do I sort of have a a broad portfolio that can be able to work through some of those events even if I can't describe them so the difference between anticipatory thinking and predictive thinking is is that a predictor says that given this event what's the probability of it occurring and an anticipatory thinking said, I have to now describe what are the events, or I have to think about the events. And some events, I don't know whether they will occur, so I just have to stay diversified. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you brought along a few topics, but before um, we dive into those, we're going to talk about another topic, which relates to CTA replication, and hoping that next time Andrew is on, he will also have some views on this because um, yesterday there was an article posted on Seeking Alpha, specifically about his product, but also mentioning the other couple of large CTA ETFs uh, that has been, uh, that that is around, that are around. But uh, specifically the article talks about the headline, DBMF driving through the rear view mirror. And of course, uh, some of the things we've mentioned on the podcast um, and I've um, been been voicing is that perhaps these replication products, at least the ones that are not based on models but based on linear regression, might be challenged when trends are not smooth, when big stuff happens. And you could certainly say that big stuff has happened uh, in the last uh, 10 days or so. Um, So it will be interesting to see how they perform towards the the mandate they have, meaning versus, in this case, the SOCGEN CTA index. As far as I can tell, it's underperforming so far this year. But actually, I think that started even before uh, this week events and I haven't caught, you know, I haven't checked the, um, you know, the uh, relative performance in the last couple of days. But it is interesting how these uh, different ways of um, of of doing quote unquote replication is uh, is going to handle this. But I think the author of this article certainly suggests that uh, it could be a challenge when trends are relatively stable. Uh, then doing linear regression, according to the author, you know, is probably fine. Uh, but when when you get uncertainty and you get lots of reversals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, estimating the exposure of managers um, because obviously a lot of the managers in the SOCGEN CTA index will be adjusting positions quite aggressively uh, since they are for the most part dynamic uh, position uh, strategies, then it might be more difficult, especially when you trade only once a week to just get that right. But we'll see. I I don't know. um, You probably saw the article that I emailed you. So what what are your thoughts on these things? I mean, I guess these are the periods where, as you said in the beginning, it's it's a good period to evaluate um, the pros and cons, both for managers, but I guess also for for strategies. Well, let, let's first uh, talk about looking through the rearview mirror. Every model, every quantitative model, 
And we'll say almost all analysts are always looking through the rear view mirror. We always are just going back in history. And so, so, so we're looking at the past data. And then our assumption is, is that this history, the looking at the past, we can be able to then do something that's extrapolative. That say that if I do this today, that then that there will tell me something about tomorrow. So, so there's always a, uh, so it's a false argument when you sort of say, well, you know, a modeler is looking through, uh, it's like looking through a rear view mirror. The issue with replication is, is, is that, uh, that you're trying to replicate something that has already been looking through the rear view mirror. So it's, a, as we'll say, it's a copy of, of what it's already been done. So there was an old move, movie I talk about that someone said, oh, I'm really busy and how do I do all my work? So I'll make a copy of myself so that there'll be two of me, so that I could get all my work done. And he sort of say, the first copy was a little bit off relative to the original. And he said, well, I'll make a third of my uh, copy of myself. And so so he made multiple copies, but each one was a little bit further off from what the reality is. So if you're trying to replicate trend following or replicate a model through you know using linear regression to try to say, like, let's try to find a way to you know figure out the factors that are drive a trend following model and then we're going to use that to be able to replicate that you're not getting the uh, the close up you're just getting a close approximation so if there are turning points if there are stop losses if there are adjustment in sizes you don't always catch that with your linear regression if you're trying to do uh, sort of a replication of a trend following index so, so you're going to have a little bit more error as you move forward with some of those models. The idea of saying is that, well, I know I'm going to have more error, but is the cost cheaper than going direct to the, uh, and that could be, it's a vehicle that's cheaper. The cost is cheaper in terms of actual costs of, uh, of managing the fund. And so they're saying is that I accept that there's error but the costs are gonna be cheaper, so that's gonna offset the error that I'm gonna have in my replication. Yeah, no, absolutely. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, it kind of reminds me of when you were talking, kind of reminds me if you're trying to, if you have to look at yourself through a mirror, but you have to see something that's, you know, say on your back or on your neck or whatever, you take a mirror to look at a mirror behind you, and it's kind of not that easy, actually, to uh, to do anyways. Right. Now, now, the real issue, I think, that when you look at that article, and I think when he talks about it, is, is I think there was the view is, is that, well, you're looking through a rear view mirror and, you know, just because we had great performance last year, well, that doesn't mean it's going to be replicated in the future. And you should anticipate or get get out of tr trend following programs, get out of some strategies because you know yeah, they're always looking in the past. And somehow, if you could look into the future, you would see that these aren't good strategies. And so, so this uh, you know really enters into the question of how often should you change your portfolio? How often should you adjust your portfolio? Uh, you know, when when you see different market events. And I think that this this, for example, goes back to when you talked about the sixty forty versus adding in trend following. You get forty forty twenty type of exposure. So. So let's look at what you, what are you really trying to buy with a trend following program? This is that ultimately, when you think about it, this is that you're trying to buy some convexity, right? Because the trend following is supposed to, let's take if you're at a trend following program that just was looking at stocks and bonds. So, and let's say you had your 40, 40, 20. Well, if stocks are doing very well relative to bonds, that trend following program should start to have a skew or have more exposure in equity. So in some sense, your overall equity exposure would be higher than 40%. So, so you're, you're starting to, to tilt more towards equity. Similarly, if let's say bonds are doing better then and uh, on a trend basis, then what that convexity component for the trend following would give you more tilt to bonds. And so I've often talked to, you know, pension funds who often might have quarterly you know, uh, investment policy committees or then they might set their investment policy on an annual basis. The real value for a trend following program or for a quantitative program in general is, is that the reaction time is much quicker 
than what would be for an investment committee. And the quicker reaction time means that you could be able to gain exposure in different asset class faster than what you would do as a committee if you wanted to put a tilt in, into the portfolio. Now, let's look in particular for this this event. This is that, uh, and, and so the trend follower might have said, okay, you know, bonds are, uh, we're seeing interest rates going higher. So I'm going to be short bonds because the price of bonds are falling. So, you know, that's where the trends are going to be. So I'm lightening up the exposure. Now, given there was a flight to quality, your core bond portfolio should be doing better right now. Your managed futures will be doing worse because of the, the reversal. But the net effect actually could still be fairly positive because what what you are doing with that trend following is giving you some positive convexity. And in the short run, that it was worked against you, but the flight to quality effect has been positive. So, so the two of them have sort of balanced each other off. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the, but by the way, just a, a, a quick thought on that. Um, now, because of the correction performance uh, that we've seen in the trend following space the last week or so, I mean, it kind of will be interesting to see whether all the investors who might have had too little exposure and realized that last year uh, or no exposure and also realized that that's not a good idea uh, last year, um, whether they will actually take the opportunity and say, well, this this actually gives us a little bit of a of a free uh, get out of jail card and 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 buy into some of these strategies at a time where uh, you could say a, a rebalancing uh, would be if you already had it you probably would need to rebalance now to get your exposure back up in trend and and take some of the gains off you've seen in your fixed income portfolio uh, in the last uh, week or so because the moves have been you know relatively big. All right. Now, Mark, you, you, you brought along a topic about uh, SVB bank and trend following. So I don't know if you already touched on that. Um, but also the other thing we wanted to talk about was just that, you know, okay, we've seen a bank run. That doesn't happen very often. But then we also need to, we also need to realize that bank runs today are very different from bank runs uh, that we may imagine um, how they were back in the 30s and 40s when people were or even in the 2008, when people were queuing up outside their banks in the UK and in many places in Europe, for sure, to to try and get their money. But but anyway, on that topic, go where you want. I don't, I don't know if you already feel you talked about it or not. I don't know what you... Well, I think that what we're really seeing is, is that a higher level of uncertainty on two levels. One is, is that there's uncertainty because you don't often see what is actually happening. So so a bank run will be a silent this uh, this time as opposed to the past. So what I mean by silent bank run, you know, we usually think of a bank run, people are lining up at the at the uh, at the branch banks, they waiting for the doors to open, they're fighting to get to the teller and then they're withdrawing money from their from their account. And you could actually see people lining up or you could sort of see the effect of, of a bank run. Now is is that with a click of the button you can be able to withdraw money. You can go to your ATM and pull money out. And if you're a corporate treasurer, is is that well maybe you had to call up your banker and you had to then be able to send a fax and then you have to send or some paperwork. But the frictions have declined, so we could sort of see money flow out much faster than we've had in the past. And so that creates more uncertainty across that, which means is that, that you have to be more careful from, uh, from uh, a portfolio manager's perspective to look for the signs that events occur. So, so and you sort of say that you look at uh, SVB, a lot of the institutional money, there's something like $40 billion that had flew out in one day. So now, now, nobody would sort of say like, well, how, did, how did you see that? How did you recognize it? Well, you heard it in the news, but you're not going to see the... Uh, the visuals of that, and so that has a big impact on on what the uh, what the market might uh, might do and react. So, so I think that there's a higher level of uncertainty concerning the bank crisis because we don't have sort of the visual information of what is going on on the institutions. Okay, so that's one. Uh, second is this is that what we sort of say that when you sort of since we're talking about quantitative models, systematic modeling, and trend following, 
you say like, well, what does this really mean for that? So why should I care? Okay, it's interesting news. We see the effect on performance, but how do you translate this into actual trend following behavior? And a couple things that you know, we, we want to talk about. One is this is that, uh, as we've talked about before, the cockroach effect. You don't just see just one event. That usually there's a series of events. So if you really are a trend follower, what you're going to say is, is that, you know, there usually isn't just one event. It's going to be a series of events. So that means is that there's likely to be more dislocations across financial firms. Two, we sort of see that there's flight to quality effects. And we know that the flight to quality effects can last for a while. It can be very abrupt in the short run. Let's so even go back to March 2020. This is that there was a dislocation in treasuries. Fed comes in, offers a lot of liquidity. There was also a flight to quality out of stocks. Reversed fairly quickly, but you have flight to quality effects. So you have to think about what that means. And three, you have to sort of say that there is an adjustment process. And I always go back to why does trend following work? Trend following works because the human decision process is often slow to adjust to phenomena. So uh, you have to have a bank crisis like that. So some people say, huh, what should I do? Then they start saying, well, where do I keep my, my, my deposit money? Maybe I should do something. Well, maybe I'm not going to do it on Monday, but if I want to think some more. And you say, like, huh, oh, this is still around for another week. Maybe I better go to the bank and start to move, or I sort of set up another bank account at another bank, and then I start moving my cash. So adjustment, speed of adjustments are often uh, slow. And the speed of adjustments is often slow when you uh, think about uh, financial decisions. So... Uh, people will take time to make asset allocation decision changes. And because of that, that's going to lead to trends in markets because the flows may adjust slowly over time. Clearly, we've had an immediate shock. But at the same time, this is that adjustments will take uh, slow. And that's what a trend follower is trying to uh, exploit or try, trying to, to take out the slow adjustments. Yeah, it's kind of like being an entrepreneur, I imagine. Um, probably many people will relate to that if they've tried it. And you have all these fancy plans in terms of building your uh, business. At least this has been my experience. And and you just realize that things just take a lot longer, that even in your most conservative kind of strategy planning and budgeting and what have you, it just takes so much longer. So I think that's another way of of uh, visualizing this um, this this process and why maybe why longer term trend following just seems to be uh, more profitable uh, than than shorter term uh, trend following. I, I was going to say I will sort of say that absolutely everything in, in, from an entrepreneurial uh, perspective takes longer than what you think is is that, uh, but I also think of the comment by Mike Tyson is, is, is that he said that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the nose. So this is a, a nose punch. So yeah. now... Uh, but, but, but the other thing, Mark, that was really interesting about this particular situation is kind of not just the speed of it, because I think nowadays we've, I wouldn't say we've gotten used to, but things do move very quickly sometimes, for sure. But also kind of what was behind it as far as I can tell, this thing that you actually had, maybe, you know, here is a bank, maybe it has a thousand, you know, corporate clients, but maybe they're all controlled in some way by 10 venture capital firms. And if these venture capital firms call up all their uh, companies that they own stakes in and say, oh, I don't think you should keep your money with SVB anymore, then gone are the money in 48 hours, right? And, and I guess this could be set by private as, as for private equity as well, because we now have some companies that are so big and control so many smaller companies, so to speak, and and therefore the dynamics to some extent in the financial world, banking world, maybe specifically, uh, has certainly changed, and and that's that's something that I don't think we maybe thought about, frankly, a lot before last Friday that maybe a few, a handful, two handfuls of people have this kind of power? Well, 
let's always go back to information because ultimately what, uh, you know, what, when we build models, any type of quantitative models, even a trend following models is, is that it's actually the fight of dealing with information. Okay. So in the SVB bank, in some sense, if you go back to their 10 Qs, you go back to sort of their financial information, all the data was there. We saw, we saw that information. So there, the data is there. We just didn't look at it or we didn't spend enough time looking at it or processing it. And the other uh, sense is, is that there's also the opaque information, and that would be from private equity where there's a lot of firms that are not public firms, so you don't have a 10Q. You don't have a uh, you know quarterly information on the, on the firms so because they're, they're not in the public domain, really, so because they're in the private equity world. So that's opaque because we don't have all of the information, yet there are private equity managers making decisions of what firms are going to be closed, what are going to get more capital, what their profits look like that we don't have that information. So, you know, I think that this this is a an ongoing um, area I spent a lot of research on is talking about what I call uh, what other people have called rational inattention. And and I want to sort of use a quote from uh, Herbert Simon, this is, this is a great economist. He goes, in an information-rich world, the wealth of information means a dearth of something else, a scarcity of whatever it is that information consumes. What information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of the recipients. Hence, a wealth of information creates a poverty of, intention, of attention and a need to allocate that att attention efficiently among the overabundance of information sources that might consume it. So ultimately, this is that we are overloaded with information. So, and we have so much information that there might be information about banks like SVP B that we don't even see. It's right in front of us. We just don't know. We, we don't have the, our attention span or lack of attention doesn't allow for it. And when you think about it, a trend follower is trying to solve the information problem or the rational inattention problem. What they're saying is, is, is that, you know, I can't focus my attention on all of the details of every financial asset. I don't know all the supply and demand of every situation. Hence, I'm going to focus on prices. Prices are primal. Prices are fundamental. And if the one thing I can focus my attention on is prices, and that's what I'll do. At the other spectrum, end of the spectrum, would be the fundamental analyst. And he said, no, I don't care about prices. I'm going to do valuation. I'm going to look at all the details. I'm going to gather all the information. I'm going to be, you know, so let's say just a, you know, just a Hoover vacuum of information. And I'm going to Hoover it all up and then be able to uh, assess what that means. And then on the other hand, we'll say at the other end of the spectrum would be the, you know, index investor who says like, well, I don't really know what to do with all this information. I I suffer from overload. So what I'll do is I'll just buy the index fund and say, give me the market. So so everybody's trying to deal with the same problem, which is the the overabundance of information and trying to figure out what do I pull in to use and what do I discard or ignore? And so when you think of that, uh, so you should always think of trend following as a way to uh, deal with this information overload problem. And so some might say, how do I deal with the information overload? I'm going to look at only short-term information. I'm going to discard all the long-term information. Others might say, no, 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 I, I got to look further back in time because I want to gather a lot of that information. Maybe what's happening in the 200-day moving average 200 days ago is, is still important. And other people might say like, well, if I'm uh, I'm looking for change points or if I'm looking for market reversals, well, then I'm going to sort of look at how I Z-score that information and say, is it out of line with everything else in the past? And that's the way I'm going to deal with this information overload. So so it's a, a long answer that this gives you an opportunity to think about what trend following is trying to do. And when you see that all of the news that was coming across about banks, all of this sort of like you're getting bombarded with new information about what's happening to SVP, what's uh, what's happening with Credit Suisse, what's happening to you know the Fed, what's happening to the ECB. Well, 
one way to deal with that is say like, nah, I'm just going to look at prices, I'm going to follow the trends because uh, I can read all the newspaper, but it's hard to assess. So tell me what the prices are doing. And that's, we'll make, that's how I'll make my decision. Yeah, no, I mean, all very good points. Uh, another thing that I think we can be, um, you know, a little bit proud of uh, in some sense is, um, but then yet again, also admitting that this was probably not what we thought about when we talked about it, but we have for quite a while discussed on the podcast this concern about liquidity. But of course, we think about the natural um, reaction is to think about liquidity in terms of, oh, can we just uh, buy and sell our futures contracts as efficiently as we normally do? And I don't know, I, I don't follow uh, you know the, the markets that closely to know whether there were any market liquidity bid-ask type uh, situations uh, during the week that we would normally um, say that that's, that's, what we, uh, that's what we think about. And we also talk about this, you know, that we have to imagine the unimaginable. And I think actually this week kind of highlights both of these concerns. One, liquidity, but it showed up in a different form, namely in a bank run. There just wasn't enough liquidity um, at the bank. But also imagining the unimaginable where, I mean, who would have imagined that a bank, you know, the 16th largest bank, and another bank, I think two of the largest bankruptcies would happen within a week uh, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, and the and the, with the speed uh, that it happened, probably not many would have put that on their kind of uh, top whatever list they have. So so I think I think a lot of these discussions that we have ongoing, they may feel a little bit abstract when in the now when we talk about them. But I don't think that makes them less important and less relevant because this this really may we, – we're living in a, chain, in a world that is changing dramatically. Our financial policies, uh, our fiscal policies are changing. Monetary policies are changing. We have a war that is just seems to be escalating over here in Europe now with countries sending fighter jets. That was unimaginable. You know, whatever, six months ago, nobody wanted to touch that. Now we're doing it, have done it, in fact. So so it comes back to this thing about being an investor in a world filled with so much uncertainty and so little lack of clarity because we have those who, of us who sit in situations where we are involved in, in, in um, the investment community, most of us, even those of us who have a few gray hairs, have not really experienced anything like the change we're seeing right now in the world. And and so for me, it always comes back to this thing about, as you just rightly said, well, maybe it's just better just to look at the price because what am I going to do with all of this information? Most of it's something I have no idea what it's going to do. I mean, if people had said a week ago, we're going to have two bank failures in the US, but the S&P is going to be up by 1.4% during the week. I'm not so sure people would have taken that bet, but yet that's what we got. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a, that's another argument for why you always want to sort of follow the the, the price action is is that I always play this experiment with, uh, you know, a lot of people. They said like, if I told you X, what do you think would have happened? So I give you perfect, uh, I give you perfect foresight. So I said, I say like, I'm going to tell you that. Th- these two banks, the 16th largest bank in the United States, the states you know, fails. There's, it has to be taken over by, by the government. And tell me what you think that you would do with the stock market. So I'm giving you a perfect, I'm giving the headline. Now you, t- but I'm not going to tell you what the market did. Tell me what you would do as your reaction. To, would you buy or sell the stock market? And people would probably say, I ah, sell the stock market. And you say, okay, you would have lost money. So it's almost as though that you play the game is, is that, Let's say I could time travel into the future. I get the headlines, but I don't get to see the market price page. <laughs> Would I still be able to make money? I could still lose money because you could sort of see like, you know, Amazon, you know, loses again in terms of no you know, negative cash flow. And yet Amazon stock goes up through the roof. Uh, now, the liquidity issue is really important because, uh, you know, we'll sort of say coming from Chicago and being at the exchanges is, is that we always have, have almost this this base view is that there's free markets for free men. But at the same time is is that 
I think we need to address the question on a liquidity issue is, is that would we be better off if let's say that they just gated some of the withdrawals of banks? So say, say like you, you stop some of the large you know, bank outflow from deposits, you limit the amount of money that, you know, a depositor could take out at any one time. So, so you put fr- frictions into the system and, and you see this on hedge funds. We hate these in terms of from an investor's perspective is that they'll have gates, but part uh, or they might say that you can only have uh, you have to have a lockup or you might can't get daily liquidity. You have to have monthly or quarterly liquidity. So, uh, you know, everyone sort of bristles at the fact that there's going to be some limitation on my behavior. But from a liquidity perspective, if the assets don't always match the liquidity of the terms of the of the contract, whether it's a depositor or a hedge fund, is that if those don't perfectly match up, is that could you create you sort of bad events for everyone? And so, uh, so, so in some sense, even a, you'd say if like a futures, uh, you know, fund, say. You say there's no reason why you shouldn't have daily liquidity because the markets are open. They're mark to market every day. At the same time, is is that if everybody was able to pull their money out by uh, on the close at four o'clock, and then you have to adjust all of your positions before the next day's open, you know, would that always be good? Would is that in the best interest of the investors who pull their money out? Is it invest in the best interest of the investors who still keep their money in? So, because there is a there is a problem is 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 that I pull out my money today, but the impact may actually be affected because it's going to cause a rebalancing of the portfolio, and it may be that the liquid assets have to be sold out, and then the remaining investors are stuck with more illiquid assets. That has an impact for all the other investors who stay in. So. You know, the question comes in, are frictions sometimes for the public good? Are frictions good for the individual when you have sort of high uncertainty? Yeah, and and actually it does open up certainly an interesting um, uh, topic to, to, to keep an eye on, and that is to see what are the flows going to be in some of these uh, CTA ETFs that has daily liquidity, And, you know, are people, when you give people daily liquidity, are they going to use it sensibly or um, or not? And uh, time will tell. Uh, I have I have my worries, but um, but we'll we'll see. Because you often bristle is to say like, well, uh, do we want to give investors daily liquidity and say, uh, well, are they going to be, uh, you know, quote unquote, smart enough to know when to pull or, or to hold? Yet at the same time, I bristle at the whole idea is, is that we want to impose our thinking on an investor. Investors should have the freedom to be able to make the choices they have, either good or bad. Uh, but at the same time, is, is that sometimes the, you know, is giving a liquidity, daily liquidity, a good thing for them? Or if you put some frictions in there, is that in their best interest? <laughs> and those are big questions that, you know, I think that have to be a, t- a touch and. Because if I'm building a model and I give people daily liquidity, by general, I'm going to have to stick with more liquid markets to begin with. If someone said, even if I have monthly liquidity, quarterly liquidity, some form of lockup, some kind of restrictions, then I can sort of say, well, I can do things that are a little bit more complex. I can build strategies that might be a little bit harder to unwind because I know I could play those through. And you could think of even, let's go back to, You know, any anybody who does sort of quasi or arbitrage type strategy, sometimes the arbitrage isn't going to be profitable until you hold it till some terminal date. So, so in some senses, is that uh, uh, are restrictions good thing? And I think that in some cases they are, but you want to have restrictions match the strategy you have. Well, there's always private equity, so uh, <laughs> yeah, no volatility, exactly. long logops. <sighs> Yes. Fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Now, Mark, uh, have we touched on all the topics you wanted to touch I, on, or is there anything I, left? No, I think we covered all of it. This is that all I can sort of say that by the next time you have me on, uh, we can have a whole new. Let's say that that the 
uh, the topics or the events may change, but our topics oftentimes will stay the same. So, so we'll so we'll have a new set of events, but we'll still be talking about you know what type of model you have, how do you risk manage, whether you have stops, whether you have variable position sizing. So the questions, uh, uh, the the uh, the questions will always be the and the topics will always be the same, but the events might change. <laughs> And the other thing I would say this highlights, and I guess maybe also inspired a little bit from uh, the conversations Alan and I have had with some of these super large, very successful CTAs, and for most of them, I would say, where they have you know two, maybe three, in Don's case, almost five uh, decades of experience. I think that's the other thing that 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 is important that I take away uh, from it. And, and 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 actually how important experience is when you go through a period like this you know if if a manager today have never seen kind of the performance change uh over a week that we've just gone through let alone the fact that the um you know as i mentioned earlier for the cta index trend index it was the second worst day in the last 22 days um you know, I, I I always I never feel personally, even after more than thirty years of doing this, I never feel great when we go through periods like this. Mostly because I care about the investors, meaning I th- I feel sorry for those who may have only come to trend following in 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 the recent month or two, and then they get this right. This is kind of their starting experience. I feel bad about that because I know how great it is if they just stick with it. And and hopefully they do, so to speak. But I will say, and maybe this is, you, 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 again, this has been very humbling uh, experience once more, but I do think there is some comfort in knowing that uh, for those who've been around for a long time, uh, even if they're down double digit this month, which, you know, quite a few managers will be, they will have had many double-digit down months in their track records um, going back. I know certainly we have. And so so there is this sense of, of um, I think comfort is the word, and we want you to ever be, you know, if hopefully not false comfort, but comfort in the fact that this is not, this, this the strategies are designed to deal with this kind of stress and these kind of weird, crazy, unexpected events that's just how trend following is. And and I think that that hopefully we can turn the conversation because I've seen on the press. I mean, the press right now, the last couple of days, it's all about how CTAs are being absolutely, in their words, kind of killed, whipsawed or whatever the number, uh, the word they're using uh, in the markets. So they always want to focus on that. What I'd like to do is to change the conversation to focus on, wow, We've never seen this before. It's not in our research data. And we're all fine. And we live to invest another day, even though we may have given back a, a few months of performance over a short period of time. That's the conversation I would love to see uh, happening. Um, so hopefully we can we can be part of that. So so we'll have that in one month's time. And so, you know, as, as we said before, is this that the, there are tremendous ordering of styles in the last week, and I will sort of will put this out as a bet that the ordering for those styles will be significantly different the next time we talk. So, so those, uh, and ultimately, this argues for why you want to have an ensemble of strategies. This is why you want to have more than one quant manager in your portfolio. This is why you want to sort of like think through what you're actually buying in the in the in the approach that a given manager has, and that you want to sort of you know diversify across approaches. So so we'll see the ordering change in one month, and then and, and we'll and we'll plan and you should plan accordingly. Absolutely, well said. All right. Well, if you enjoyed this conversation and all the other conversations we have on the podcast. Um, perhaps I could ask a small favor, and that is for you to go and leave a rating and review uh, on the preferred podcast.
podcast platform that you use, whether it's Amazon, Apple, Spotify, we would love if you would just take five minutes of your time. If you don't know how to do it, you can go to toptradersonplot.com forward slash review and it gives you all the instructions that you need. Of course, keep sending your questions. I have a feeling that there might be a few coming in this week because next week, Jim is back on the podcast. He's had a obviously to take a couple of months off doing other stuff, but now he's back and we'll be tackling some interesting topics, I'm sure, especially in the given volatility environment uh, and and actually also based on some of the conversations we had a couple of months ago in terms of his expectations. Um, so make sure you send us the questions as usual. Info at toptradersonplug.com is where you would send them. I think that's about it. I will encourage you to go to the website, check out the latest blog post, um, the monthly report that Rich and I just posted. Hopefully that will be of uh, use to you uh, and interesting as well. And um, I think that's about it from Mark and me. Thanks ever so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. And as usual, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.